what are those things? I, I'm intrigued. What are the what are your secrets? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'd say one certainly is to have strong social support. You know, we have to have that wherever we are. And um, and talking about single women, particularly for single women to create their own. If you're not part of a couple, you're going to need to to certainly have that. So strong social support is one. Um, I'd say the ability to renegotiate roles. Let's say you're part of a, if you're part of a couple, you may have laid down things. I mean, I've been married a lot of years and we kind of figured out who's doing what as we were married and we had children and then as we got older. But then after we both left our primary careers, there were some, there was some renegotiating to do in terms of who was going to be doing what. Like I, I didn't, I do not like to cook. I hate to admit and I don't like doing the dishes. I'd much rather cut the grass or do that kind of thing. So we oh, have cool. done some okay. big role reversals with that. So that would be another one. So um, renegotiate the rules. I've never heard anybody oh, talk about rules, roles. We roles. didn't really have rules laid down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but so renegotiate your roles within yes. within the family, within the within the yes. Yeah. So if you have a spouse, um, if you're if you still have adult children living there, I'd say it's important to sit down. Um, one woman I had spoken to at a talk afterwards, she came up and said, "That's funny, you said that because she she was in a very high position," and she said. My husband told me now that I'm home all the time, I talk to him like I'm one of his employees ordering him around and it, it wasn't working so well. So that one sort of resonated with her about that. So that, yeah, that's re, re, important. Reading as you your role, look, you're no longer a high powered executive. It's just, <laughs> well, it's nothing like, I, I, I can see having to renegotiate that. But if it's, you're married, the kids are out of the house. But when you have kids in the home, you, you, you're, you're a, a low powered uh, executive, no matter no matter how high powered you are, even if you're the CEO somewhere, it, your kids don't treat you like the CEO, right? They don't care. They don't. That know. would be true. Uh, would be all true. right. So start. Uh, so, so social support. Yeah. Renegotiate. What's um, what's what's? I'd, what's I'd say connection? another one. Have something to wake up for every day, and that that kind of gets the, to that idea of purpose you know what is your thing to get up for every day they can be it can be very lofty you're trying to save the world or you're trying to save the turtles the turtles yeah. trying, save the turtles gonna go save the turtles and, and i went to the university of maryland so i'm a turp so that's kind of a natural fit that i went there but hey, it's not um, your fault little guy that you were the first <laughs> egg laid in this very deep sand cavern it's not your fault that you came out first you get the longest way to climb you got all your brothers and sisters on top Okay. <laughs> That's right. So um, I, I think that one's very important to have some structure to your day, but to have also obviously some free time built in. But what is your reason for getting up for? every morning. I, I think that's a big one and have something to do that. And those things can be quite different from things you've ever done. So I, for example, for me, um, tennis, I, I like tennis and that goes into the next one, which is really have strong social support. A lot of these things sort of overlap, but we need to have that social support. And for me, tennis checks a lot of the boxes because it's also of course the exercise point of view and the living healthy point of view and it has the social support and it structures your time for you so that that's an important one to have something have you have day. you written about the longevity uh, with tennis you've seen that study the tennis um, adds 9.7 years to your life on average I did not know that statistic. No. Okay. 9. I just 7. helped you out with your next article for healthy living. I like living. that. It is well, one of my favorite. 9.7 uh, years. It, 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 all, all, the, so many great studies come out of the yeah. Netherlands. I don't know what it is about the Netherlands, uh, but the, these, uh, these Northern European countries uh, have all these great longitudinal studies. And one of them ha essentially studied retirees that do all sorts of different, actually, I don't know if it was retirees. I think it was just studying different activities. So are you a runner or a biker? Do you play volleyball? Do you do, again, a variety of different uh, physical activities? And many of them led to a longer average longevity. Okay. But number one on the list is tennis. And it adds an average 
of 9.7 years. It's like a decade extra for tennis players, which is probably really back to your point. It really, very few things check all those boxes. You've got uh, activity, you're outside, and it's highly social because when, you know, again, we're not... uh, we're not all Roger Federer. A lot of us play doubles and uh, you, you, um, you are forced to have a, essentially a foursome. You have, you have four people play doubles. So it checks all the boxes. It's weight Uh, bearing and it's, you know, that pounding, which is good for your bones too, as far as bringing those up and you're, you're moving. And so it's, it's all different kinds. You're absolutely right. I didn't know the 9.7. I love it. Well, now it's the next article. It's got, it's a home run article. (laughs) Um, all right. So, so let's talk about single women. Uh, let's talk about the finances of that. I know you have a really big focus on that. Um, tell me about the, the unique, let's call it the unique challenges. I mean, in new retirement, the new retirement, which is your book, the ultimate guide to the rest of your life. And then you wrote this, uh, the also single women's guide to retirement. What are, what's specific to women that's different than maybe couples or or men in general well the funny thing was the reason i wrote that book and and like i said um i am married is because i would do some talks and uh after one talk like a couple women came up and you said you know we're we're single and it's it seems a lot of what you're saying it's it's good but it often seems more related to couples so you know what about us so people who have were divorced or people who were, you know, there's this whole big thing. Dr. Bella DePaulo does a lot of research on um, people who are single at heart, people who aren't single as a default because they're divorced or they got dumped or whatever, (laughs) but because they chose that they are very happy just as they are. And that's been very recent, that kind of research, which I find fascinating, quite a few women who just do not want to get married. But so I started looking at the contingent of single women in terms of uh, their numbers. And of course, when you do talk about longevity, that they are going to, most of us, 80 to 90% of the time, if you're a woman, you are going to be single at some point, right? Mm -hmm. Because the difference in maybe perhaps when you get married and because of the lifespan. And so they're also going to be 80 to 90% responsible for making all decisions. And that's something that I think a lot of women maybe aren't as good um, or haven't in the past been doing. Wait, but, say, whoa, whoa. Go, let me go back to that statistic. You said 80 to, 80 to 90% of all decisions. You're talking about even if you're married? Or you what? No, financial decisions because you will become single at some point. Got it. So yeah. 80 to 90% of women are going to be responsible for making oh, all right. decisions for themselves. Maybe I didn't say that correctly. Yeah, so that's, that's what I mean. So it's a, a big chance even if you haven't and, and have more traditional roles laid down, where you're going to be responsible for all the roles ultimately. So it's it's good to either get a certified financial planner or somebody to help you get to that point that you feel comfortable doing that if you don't want to take on the job yourself, just like we have people take on other roles for us. But if you're going to be single, you need to know, you know, to whom to go to, to do all those, make all those decisions. That's very interesting. Single at heart. Yeah. When you're talking about single at heart, this, these are people that they really just, they really would rather be, Yes. I guess how is it? And why is that though? What, what's behind single at heart? Is it just full autonomy? Uh, what is that? Autonomy is a is a big one. They they feel they don't need another person. It doesn't mean they're not social. Doesn't mean they don't love people. Uh, but in the end, they are happiest by themselves um, in terms of living with somebody. But yet, it's not that they don't have a lot of social connections with other people. So it's just. We always see as sort of marriage being the default, but now there's more and more research coming out that a lot of people just are very happy being single. They they don't need to be part of a couple. And I think that's something newer. We haven't really seen in the last before the last decade or so coming out about that. So what do women so women need to A prepare for 
at some point they're going to be making all the financial decisions. So that's one. What else that right. is unique to women? Well, I think women still need that social component. You know, we've all read the statistic like um, being lonely is equal to eating, to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, right? Mm. So it's not as if they are antisocial. It's just that they don't feel they need another person that has to be there with them to, you know, complete them. They're, they're whole by themselves. So that would be another one, the social support. So when single women, when um, people ask about relocating, for example. I think that's a, a big thing that they need. They they certainly want a social group. It might just not be a spouse, but they certainly need to look at the kind of um, places they might purchase or whatever, where you can have that social support kind of thing built into it. So say, for example, um, a community where it's easy to find places to volunteer, or say, for example, kind of these active adult or master plan communities where they have all these activities that you can be part of to meet other people. And every time I have, we have moved, we, I always picked a new community to move to or newer because it's people are more anxious to make friends. It's easier to make friends. And especially if you're, you know, depending how outgoing you are, or if you're not as outgoing, if you're in a community where everyone is new, people are, are reaching out to you. And so I, I always find that's a, a good way to pick a place if you're going to relocate. That is a really, really interesting point. So when we talk about relocating, it, it, when and I wanted to ask you about this specifically, the there is this great, I don't know if it's called wanderlust about, oh, I'm going to go live somewhere new. And again, top 10 in my life, I, a list of things I'll maybe probably never do would be one, like go move to Texas. Like I want to go just live in Texas or I want to go live in California. My, my little brother lives or my younger, one of my younger brothers lives in uh, LA near Manhattan beach. It really is a pretty amazing place. Love to go do that. Now, will I ever really go do that anytime soon? Probably not Four kids in school and in, in middle school and elementary school and it's just really hard to pick up and move when you've got that much interconnection. But I, I think about it. And then I think about in retirement, if you were to do that and you're going to move to Texas or you're going to move across the country and move to California, then that's tough because in my mind, the default is, wow, you got a long, you got an uphill battle to reintroduce yourself to the community, find good friends. I mean, good friends are typically longer term people that you've, you've known for a long time. And how do you, but you're, you're bringing up the point. Don't just say, oh, I want to go live in some new place in Texas, or I want to go to California. You're saying, no, 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 pick a community to relocate to, not a, not a climate, not a town per se. Yes, I would say that, but it's all the other things that are important to you. You know, you've got to look at the cost of living. You've got to look at um, the, the taxes. You've got to look at what kind of environment do you want. You, you may want four seasons. You may want two homes. So those are all important. But, but I think the idea of connection, how are you going to ensure that? And I also think it depends how you grow up. I'd say if we weren't um, transferred around to different places, I'd probably still be in the same area where I grew up. I'm one of six kids. Some of my family's there. Others have moved to other places because of transfers or whatever. But I saw it was fun and it was interesting and it was a huge growth experience for me too, I'd say. Finding another job, meeting people. And, and I'm, I'm sort of on the right between an introvert and an extrovert. I can fake being extroverted. I'm probably really a little more introverted if I had to really admit it. But it, it was such a growing experience to have to force yourself a little bit into doing different kinds of things and learning different things and maneuvering different things that I found it very exciting. Um, the other thing, of course, is with children, whether you're, you're single or, or married, you have adult children. You know, a lot of people say that they want to live near their children, but I know my kids, they're in three different cities now. They're all adults with their own families. And uh, how do you, you know, arrange that? We've come up with the idea like, guess what? We'll come in and we fly in and we babysit like our son and his wife just went 
to Scotland for 10 days and we took care of the kids for them. So that gives them a chance to get away. We have a time we're immersed together and uh, it, it works for us. But I know that doesn't work for everyone. A lot of people say they, they want to live close to their family, but that doesn't always work out, obviously. Yeah, it doesn't always work out because we can't control where our kids go. Right. I, I you know, again, I do, I think there is, is some power uh, being near your kids. I mean, one of one of the studies I did for what the happiest retirees know is yeah. uh, is happiness levels relative to location of adult children. Yes. And I do I do see happiness levels tend to rise once you live near half your kids, fifty uh, percent or more. It does tend to rise happiness levels, but to your point, you don't have to do that to be able to see your kids. To your right. in your example, your ten full blown days dealing with or dealing with uh, lovingly babysitting and spending time with all of these grandkids. The, wh where do you go? Uh, I, I'm always fascinated too. a lot of families that I've worked with over the years. Uh, Jan are, do you end up in, we're here in the Southeast. So I'm based out of Atlanta uh -huh. and you're, I mean, you're in, in Florida, uh -huh. but I have so many families that I've worked with over the years have moved from Atlanta to uh, probably number one spot would be the villages in, mm -hmm. in, in central Florida. And I've had a few folks go there. It was too much for them. Mm -hmm. And they just said, look, I can't take, you know, 14 different water polo events per week and right. uh, golf carts and fun all the time. Right. But I'd say call it 80 to 90% of people have stayed there and they really love it. And I, I just wanted your take on, some of these other active adult communities. Yes. Are there a lot of places a lot like the villages or is that a very special, unique place? Uh, tell me about that. Cause I'm, I'm fascinated by those moves. There are a lot of active adult communities with the 55 plus. Now, one thing I do want to say, because the villages started in about uh, the eighties, when people are looking at a place like that and those active adult communities, yeah, they're active. There are plenty of things to do. Again, I think if you are extroverted or introverted, they can be good because they usually have somebody setting up things. You just have to kind of show up. Like if it's a book club, do they have performances? Do Are they doing, uh, you know, social different kinds of committees and they organize them sort of for you and you just have to participate. So I think it's a good thing for that. But here's my caution with, with those kinds of things. If they've been around a long time, let's and let's take the villages, for example, people tend to age in place. So the village is now the average age there is 72, but you only have to be 55 plus to move in there. And I think that's true. A lot of these active adult communities that started in the 80s, you now look at the average age and they're 72. That could be perfectly fine with you, but some people have told me, you know, they're a little surprised. They will go to one that has been around a long, long time. They're a number in Arizona and find it wasn't the place for me because I was like the youngest person there. You know, I was 55 and I was moving there and I didn't feel like I fit in as much. And, and I can say that they can be kind of clicky. You get these people that have all moved there and kind of grown together. It can be maybe a little bit more difficult, but it certainly has the amenities. It certainly has the activities. Um, I'd also caution now at this point in time, we need to look at uh, politics as well. What is the politics of a place that you're going to move to? Um, the, the villages is heavily Republican. So I think that would be important. If you're a big Democrat, you may not feel like you fit in as well. And yeah. that is something to consider as well when you do those. On the other hand, those active adult communities, they have a lot going on. You can be as involved or uninvolved. Now you've heard of Margaritaville probably, the Jimmy Buffett kind of theme communities or three of those going up. And they're also very popular, but they're new and they're getting in an influx of, of younger people, you know, in the fifties at this point. That sounds awfully fun. If you're, if you are 55 and you're ready to retire and you, it, number one on your list is a place called Margaritaville, <laughs> it probably attracts kind of a fun group of people. 
It does. For the last book, I had interviewed somebody who um, went there. She just couldn't believe it. She made friends so easily, but it was a brand new community. It's in Daytona Beach. Um, you know, most people have heard of Daytona Beach, Florida. It's sort of the fun capital, or not capital area, but fun area there in Florida. And she just said it was so fun. Now she works there. She loved it so much. She decided to go there. Um, she was single, but there was a big single contingent, and she checked that out as well to be sure that there was going to be enough for her and enough social support as a single. You talk about these some niche retirement lifestyles. What are those? Oh, well, there are so- non-traditional retirement <laughs> lifestyles, niche yeah. lifestyles. Let's talk about non-traditional. What are you talking about? Well, there are so many communities that can be targeted to a specific group. Like now there are communities with vineyards in them. There are communities with working farms in them. There are communities, and I'm saying niche in a good way, like you can find something for every interest you have. I play tennis at Spruce Creek Community. It's a fly-in community. The houses, you can, they have a, uh, you, you have your air, your airplanes there. John Travolta used to have an airplane there. He used to have a house there in Spruce Creek. Uh, there's ones built just for male people called Nowcrest. And interestingly, dogs are not allowed in, in the community. You can, <laughs> I thought that was whoa, kind whoa, of whoa. So hold on. There's a community that's all guys, all men, <laughs> no, and no, no dogs. For letter carriers, they could be men or women. It, no, and spouses too. Letter carriers. They don't have I dogs. I totally missed that, Jan. Oh. Okay. Mail as in the U.S. Postal Service? Oh, mail. M-A-I-L. Yes, mail. Mail. Mail? There's a, yeah, there's a niche of people that work yes, in the Postal Service? Yes, you have to have been connected. It's called NALCREST. It stands for the National Association of Letter Carriers and something else. Yes, and there's um, an in Indian... Talk about community. a niche. Talk that about is, a niche. That is a true... That's a true niche. Yes. So there are a lot of That's the airports. That's amazing. I you're, know. You're not kidding about these niches. <laughs> that is a true niche. Niche. Holy I like cow. to say niche. Yeah. yeah I, I say I like where say I'm niche. from, I, Pennsylvania, they, I, we grew up saying niche. People niche live on, sounds um, better. People live on ships now. That's, I would say that's niche you know people actually there is um the world that was the first big one they're building what's it called other, the world the world it was, used to be called the world of residency with sea at the end kind of clever now they just call it the world where you buy a place a stateroom on the ship, they have chefs there. You are living on the ship. It's called the world. There are other ones being built right now too. I mean, let me tell you, the, the state rooms might be about $13 million. This is not for the faint of heart to be going there. But when we're talking niche, I'm talking niche. So there are- Where is the, where in the world is the world? <laughs> <laughs> what harbor uh, does it sit in? Yeah, where does it go ultimately? I, I can't tell you that offhand. I can tell you that everyone who lives on there, though, gets together and they decide on the itinerary. So you can put where is the world, the ship, and it will show you where its itinerary is, which is determined by the people who are living on that ship. Now they do- Who does do, travel, so it's not like sitting in a harbor. You're not on a boat no, in a harbor. It's going no. all over the place. It's going all over the it's place. It's like a constant cruise. It's a constant cruise, yes. You've got to be kidding me. These are so new. I've learned about They're mail very, as, a, as in letters yes. uh, communities. The world where you get to live, you're a, a constantly traveling ship. Yes. Sounds like an ultra, ultra luxe cruise. We're not. Uh, it yeah. is. We are ultra talking. Luxe. Yes. I went to one uh, on the Disney property. Um, that is a, a Disney community. And that was very interesting. Like I, I would say it's for Disney groupies almost, but in a nice kind of way. There were people who lived there. It, when you walked around, even like the benches had the kind of dwarves kind of warm, you know, integrated into all the decor. And it's right on the property of, of Disney. So you, do, you know, there are people, when we took the tour, this woman told us that somebody had two, one for her, her own house and then one for her family when they come down. Um, so there, there are all different kinds of ones. There's, there's one, and I don't think it's around anymore. It was in Texas. It had a racetrack in it for people who like to race. So we have them for the planes. We have them for the um, 
all different kinds of things that are, are really quite niche. They are building now LGBTQ plus communities. Um, they are just really pretty much anything you can think of. A lot of places like a commune where you have the common living, you'll have a central house where people will eat dinners together, but each will have his or her own home, or you could be single, you could be married, but you have that sort of an environment if you like that. There are places where nudists live. We have a couple of those in Florida, or I should say clothing optional communities. So when we talk niche, I mean, we're talking there something for everybody out there. <laughs> Have you written about a lot of these in Ideal Living magazine? Uh, not in Ideal Living so much, more probably in the book. I like, like in this most recent book, I list a lot of them and their names. And if you're interested and in what their websites are, that I think your book sales have. just went through the roof. I want to, <laughs> that's why that in itself is fascinating. The, it's I, fascinating. I, guess I, didn't, I didn't realize it, it. I guess if you think about it, it doesn't surprise me. We, we've, we've developed so much specialization and so much, uh, you know, in, in here we are in 2022, you can find whatever you want, but I, but it is a big deal to have an entire community based around something. Yes. So I don't know if my, I don't know if I've gone that far to think that we've gotten that, uh, niche oriented, but it's wonderful to think about it. Right. I think that it's a very, it's inspiring and it's something that we can look forward to. Um, I bet you there's going to be ranch communities. I'm sure there's ranch. If you want to, Go out west. Prop, yes, there are tiny home communities. I went to a couple of those. They are fascinating where um, uh, there were quite a few single women who owned them. Um, they were, talk about tiny, uh, there were probably about 700 square feet. So you would have to be uh, a whiz. A lot of people had built an extra kind of a storage area on their small lot. But it was, it was very cute. They had all different kinds of activities. And these were people who really wanted to just pare down. It's actually, you had mentioned the villages. There was one fairly close to the village that I went to visit. And, um, you know, those people were enjoying themselves, all kinds of activities. But the houses, tiny houses. I don't know if you've heard of that term before. Of but course. That, yeah. Okay. But so, so that's an ultra affordable option. So the tiny house would be. It, would it's be not the as opposite. affordable as you think. I'm going to huh. say. I mean, they were. Uh, this is near the villages, so it's it's in Florida and it's more inland, and they were two and three hundred thousand. They but but you were part of a community, so that also included you were paying the fees for being part of the larger community with all the activities and a social director and things like that. They had a pool, so to tease out just the house from that, it was sort of all incorporated into it. Um, and they also say about those, you, you, you really have to be, I think, a special kind of person to want something that little. I, it probably couldn't be me. I tend to, like, even all my books, where would I put them? I was walking around thinking, how could I live in one of these? But I have a single sister in New York in a tiny apartment. She, she'd be a great candidate for one. Fascinating, fascinating thought around where to go. And I guess I hadn't thought as much about really picking a community. And if socialization is on the top of so many of our lists as a key to happy retirement, and socialization is a challenge because we leave work, so we leave a network typically, and then you've got to, to some extent, rebuild that connectivity. And it's, it's work, it's time, it's effort. The community itself is a really, really interesting way to solve that that challenge and and challenge, solve the challenge of socialization and i think it's i love that we were able to go through that so thank you for that and, and i'd say along with with volunteering too of course because once you get involved in something you are exposed to a whole lot of um, different people and different ideas. And like, I, I'm on a board of trustees of our library. So I've met a lot of interesting people there. We never really realized till I joined what the li how many things a library does for, for the community is amazing. Or on different committees, I'm on different committees within the community and different kinds of volunteer activities. So those are all huge too. Besides just where you live, what are you doing in the larger community that helps yourself and, and helps others that, you know, idea of purpose that you had mentioned earlier. Speaking of, and I know you've done a lot of work with 
CPAs and other financial professionals. What about you? You've got your take on the psychology of of money. I mean, twenty twenty two rough year in markets, lots of volatility. We have inflation. There's always there's always a wall of worry, and we've got to be able to. One of your earlier points is that you've got to have enough. So that means that you've got to have some investments. For again, happy retirees have a, multiple different financial checkpoints that I write about in the book. One of them is a liquid retirement savings, but it's tough, right? Once you get to your biggest amount ever, typically is when you're retiring, and then the volatility of owning stocks and fixed income and a variety of different assets is is psychologically difficult for some people. So what about what's your take on the psychology of, of money? Well, I think everything you said is is true. I, I actually have a neighbor called John, and, and his whole background is financial, and his um, wife is not into that aspect of it. And um, in terms of that, what he, he actually did is he wrote a little booklet for her that said, and it's entitled, If I Die. And, and and that has all of the all of the information in it. But certainly the idea of being able to plan ahead for that long horizon for retirement is so very important. And and like I mentioned before, people thinking they could maybe have a second job, but probably easier now to have a second job, but it's not not guaranteed how they do need a lot professional help. I mean, I'm married to a CPA, so what can I say? I'm lucky you're a certified financial planner, but those who don't, certainly that's my suggestion to get to get help of doing that. We didn't talk about starting another business though in, in retirement or your second phase of life. Do you see retirees starting their own businesses? I know you talked about, you've got to have a product, people, passion. Yeah. Is it fairly common or is it, are these hobby, hobby type incomes that maybe people make a little bit of money, but what is your advice on that piece of the equation? My advice is if you, I, I've always kind of liked working. I've always enjoyed it. Um, so if you don't need to and you don't want to and you don't have to, well then, okay, that's your choice. But if you want to, uh, I see a lot of um, women, I was, I will say in my community who are real estate agents, who are realtors and, you know, a, 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 a large number of men as well, but I'd say predominantly women. And um, I, you know, it's a fairly easy, I don't want to say easy in terms of sounding bad, but easy thing to do. I went through a course one time just for the heck of it and took the test to see what it was like and what it involved. Um, but the problem with real estate, as you probably know, is when everybody is buying and selling, then the number of realtors go up. And then when nobody is buying and selling, the number of realtors go down. So it's sort of that thing that you always have about the same kind of competition for it. So I see a lot of people who are, are realtors, I would say, as a second career, because it's a pretty straightforward bar. I see a lot going into perhaps um, teaching people who have left a career, uh, people that have master's degrees. And I taught at a community college for a number of years, and we had a lot of people who are uh, attorneys who had retired. They were teaching law classes, who are accountants, who are teaching accountants classes, who are uh, psychologists teaching psychology classes. So that's kind of a natural one if you like the idea of teaching as a second career. Now, of course, so many places are dying and, and desperate for teachers. You know, in the state of Georgia, there's a push to allow people to skip kind of some of the protocol to become a teacher because we're set, we have such a shortage. If you've had a professional career, the the the, the the state of Georgia is saying, look, uh, let's, let's lower some of the regulations to become a teacher because we need, we need people. The, uh, maybe the last thing I want to go to, well, I'd, I'd like your, 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 if you could sum up your philosophy about retirement and happiness, I'd love to hear that, but I'd like you to do it speaking backwards if you could. 
Yakko, I not got that. Since I said what I said a last echo, I I can just take any word and and reverse <laughs> it. It's a bizarre thing. I don't know really. I I think I can just visualize the words. I, I tried out. So what did you just say there? What I know you said it backwards. And again, for for proof of this concept, you can always play it play it backwards and see if it really worked. But what what did you say backwards there? I said I I can do that, but this is how it sounds. So I is I can is knack do is odd. Uh, this is sit. But is tub, you, a oi, uh, sound, stinuas. I can just sort of visualize the word. So it's the same sequence forward, but I'm just, I'm just saying each word individually backwards. And, um, that was my moment of fame of trying out for David Letterman's stupid human tricks. I did not make it on his show. Uh, cause there was, I know because see, this is what it sounds, sisai tata sinuas echo. That's how it sounds. So what, what are they really going to do about it and prove it and all of that? I think um, that, that <laughs> they would play it backwards is really what they would do. Well, I guess you would, it's not it, totally it, backwards. It's is not, it? It, it's each, I'm pronouncing it like it's the word. Like if I said like, which is L I K E. L I K E, I would say ek, like E K A I L. So it doesn't really sound it if you, re you know what I'm saying, play the back. Oh, I see what you're saying. The exact same. Plus, and the, then that just, act, did, did you work on it or did it something that you just realized you could just do without trying? Well, the real truth is, I think I started developing when I had to go to church every Sunday and I was in there for an hour and um, I would read the missal and then I'd start. Doing it backwards, I guess, in my head, and then I just found I could I could just visualize the words and 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 do it. So it was it's just a strange um, ability that I have. Other <laughs> I people it's... can. There are other people who can do it. I was on the Tyra Bank show, and she had another person who could do it on there as well. So it, I'm not unique in the world, but I don't think there are too many of us out there who do it or admit to doing it. What can I tell you? I love it. I love it. Well, what about, so, so maybe just sum up your, uh, if, if you were to describe a happy retirement, what, what is it? Yeah, well, I think it's like my little mug of that says, oh, can you read hang that? The uh, create, create a life you don't need a vacation from. I love that. Somebody yeah. had given me this and I thought, you know, that kind of really sums it up. Um, that's how we want to create a, a life. And how do we do that? We do that by giving back. We do that by socializing. We do that by trying to stay healthy. And here's a little thing I read the other day I think is just very instructive to stand up, put your one leg behind the other and balance for 10 seconds. Can you do that? And they found, of course, after 65, um, the biggest cause of accidental death is falls. And if you can't do that on your right and left leg of standing up and for that 10 seconds, yeah, okay, put it behind and then you wanna count to 10, not behind, you kind of wrap it behind so your, your one leg is kind of touching the other behind you and do that for 10 seconds and do that on both legs. And it's surprising how many people cannot. You, you're doing a great job. So far, so, so good. You're gonna live to a thousand. I like it, <laughs> I like it. So. Uh, Jan, this is awesome. You, uh, very, very new, fun information. Uh, I think that the, a great takeaway here is just how if you're moving, you're moving to a community. I've been thinking about it backwards, no pun intended, for a long time. I keep thinking about, oh, what's a cool town to move to one day? Maybe it's more about what's a what's the best community to move to one day. And maybe it, we'll, we'll start looking at it a little bit differently from you. So thank you, Jan. Well, thank you very much.